a um, passage of scripture, very, very uh, familiar to us, one we could, we could quote. It says in Matthew 1, 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all across uh, Soldatna, probably America, tonight and last night, churches had their Christmas Eve service. And most all of them read a, 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 a portion of the scripture concerning the birth of Christ and taught a little sermonette to uh, their congregations about um, the birth of Christ and the, the beauty of that. And that's a very beautiful thing. But we're not like that. I, I've sat and I tried to prepare something that's Christmas Eve, and this is Christmas Eve. But we're a church that just wants preaching, and we're a church that hungers after the presence of God. Whether it be a Christmas Eve service, whether it be whatever it might be, we're just a church that, that desires to grow in Him and to feel His power and His presence. And so, I just couldn't put together a, a, a little Christmas Eve sermon where we just greet one another, clap our hands, and, and fellowship and go home. And so I, I want to preach to you tonight, if that's okay. I want to bring the Word of God to you tonight. And so I want to bring to you this message, and I have entitled it, This Baby Changed Everything. This Baby Changed Everything. God, we thank you for the power of your word, and we thank you for the power of your spirit in and among us tonight. I ask you, O oh God, to minister to each and every heart that is here tonight. Lord, as we bring this message, God, as we study your word, as we, as we hear, God, the message that you have for us tonight, let it saturate our hearts, and let us respond through the power of your spirit tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I wrote a play many years ago about the Christmas story. Before I was a preacher, I was a playwright. <laughs> you see, in reading the Christmas story, I was amazed at the backstory that you never read about. I was completely amazed at the, the things that we don't take into account or consider concerning the Christmas story. The Christmas story centers around two people, Mary and Joseph. They are a young couple who has gotten engaged to be married. Marriage is a very, very special thing in two people's lives, in the, in the, in the two that are going to get married. In the Jewish custom, Marriage was a very, very big event. It was something that the entire family participated in the marriage. It was a huge event for them. It was a Jewish custom. And it was planned and carried out with a great amount of tradition. And so it was that these two were in the process of planning and preparing for their great big event. Mary had a lot of work to do before she could marry Joseph. And as Jewish tradition will teach you, the husband, Joseph, had a lot of work to do before he could marry Mary. There was a lot of work that he had. To, he had to build the house. They did not live with mom and dad. They didn't rent an apartment. They had to have their own house. Joseph had to build that house, had to have it ready to go before he could marry Mary. Everything was going along just beautifully. Nothing was out of the ordinary. They had everything down to a T. Mary had her colors picked out. Joseph was, was in the process of getting this house ready to go. And then one day, an angel named Gabriel, appeared to Mary. He had a message for her about her future. Luke 1, 29 through 31. And when she saw him, 
She was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. That's a good thing. I want favor with God. Wouldn't it be awesome for the angel to come to you, ladies, and say, You have found favor with God. That's a beautiful thing. But then he had something to tell her. He said, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Now when we read this story, we are not considering the situation that, the, that Mary has just been put in. Right. We don't consider the situation that she has just been put in. She is living in a culture that has absolutely zero tolerance, zero, zero tolerance for any illicit uh, relationships outside of marriage. None whatsoever. And Mary is not married. She has not been married to Joseph yet. She is an unmarried woman in this type of culture. She is engaged to a man, but she has not yet married him. And she has been told that she will be found with a child. She's been told from the angel that you will become pregnant. The pregnancy is a miraculous one where she will be carrying the child of God or the child that God created in her womb. She will be a virgin, but she will be pregnant by a miracle. Now, this is not something that you can go to your mom and dad and explain. No, really, mom. Honest dad. The angel came. I, I am with child, but it's from God. Joseph, I know you see what's going on here, but this is from God. Oh, really? Oh, really, Mary? How do you tell Joseph? How do you stand in front of the man that you're going to marry and tell him I'm pregnant? Now, Joseph knows. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. I didn't have anything to do with this. Now, you're the one that's supposed to be married to me. And you're the one that's supposed to give yourself to me. But you are telling me that you're pregnant and I can see that you're pregnant. How does, how does she tell Joseph? When she did tell Joseph, he was absolutely furious. The Bible doesn't say, and Joseph flew off the handle and called Mary every name in the book. It doesn't say that. What it does say is that Joseph said, I'm going to put you away. I'm not going to marry you. Sorry, you did me wrong. You're supposed to be my bride. You're supposed to be the one that I marry. But, but I, I'm not going to marry you because of what you've done. Can you imagine what it was like to be Mary at the moment that she tells Joseph and Joseph looks at her in disgust and says, I'm not marrying you. What a predicament to be in. What a place for Mary to find herself in. Let me tell you something. This baby changed everything for Mary. It changed everything for her. It, it made such a dramatic difference in her life. We know the story of how God sent Gabriel to Joseph. Matthew 1 and verse 20 is the recording of this conversation between the angel and Joseph. It says, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Joseph was convinced to take Mary as his wife. They were married, and then Jesus was born. But this child completely changed their lives. He was not planned by them. That was not the way they wanted to start their family. That was not the way they designed things to happen for themselves. 
but he was given to them by God. All of this happened at the birth. All of this that happened at his birth stood out in an amazing fashion. Everything that happened at his birth was so miraculous. It was so bathed in the supernatural. Angels from heaven came and spoke to shepherds and told the shepherds to go down into Bethlehem and there they would find a child the king of the Jews that had been born. And they would find him in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And then they heard a voice from heaven, a a sound from heaven saying, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. The the wise men saw a star in the east and they they saw and knew that a king had been born, a king of the Jews had been born, and they traveled from wherever it was they were from all the way to Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph were standing there when when the shepherds came in to see the child. They were there when the knock came or wherever they were at, when the wise men showed up and presented to them gifts. Could you imagine being Mary and Joseph and having all of these supernatural, miraculous things happen? You've got a little baby. Brother uh, Mitchell, you've got this little baby in the hospital, and these strange people are showing up at the door, and they're bringing you gifts, and they're talking about the miracle of this child. Wow. I, I, I know that I was conceived of the Holy Ghost. I really just don't understand what all this is. They didn't know. Mary and Joseph had to get up in, out of Bethlehem and, and flee for their lives because Herod was trying to kill the baby. Everything absolutely changed when Jesus came into the life of Mary and Joseph. They were never the same again. They were never the same again. Their life was bathed in the supernatural constantly. They would forever be changed by the coming of Jesus into their lives. They were forever changed by Jesus. Jesus came for a purpose. There was a reason that God robed himself in flesh and came on the earth to us. He was called in the Bible, Emmanuel which being interpreted means God with us. Wasn't a separate of the Godhead, a a third person. No, it was God Almighty robed in flesh. God had a specific plan that he would accomplish through the life of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the purpose of his coming that we read in our opening scripture was to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save his people from their sins. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. His entire mission was this cause. He spent his entire ministry in his life doing this one thing, to seek and save those that were lost. Seeking the lost was not a hard thing to do. It wasn't like he had to go on an Easter egg hunt and try to find the lost among all of the people. My friend, they were all lost. When Jesus came to Jerusalem and he began his ministry, every person that he came to needed salvation. Every person that he came to needed this gospel. And he came to reach those people with this gospel. He came to give them the truth of his word and the, and the hope of salvation for their life. We find people that were everywhere around him. People with so much in their lives that had, had, destroyed, had, had, had destroyed their lives. There, there were people in such great need wherever Jesus went. Jesus found the multitudes of people that were lost. He found the religious leaders that were lost, that were completely wrapped in their self-righteousness. They thought that they were righteous. They thought that they were good men. They thought that they were the leaders that should teach all men how to live. But Jesus exposed them as being self-righteous bigots. We find that, that Jesus found people that were ill, that were all around him, lepers that were in need of healing, blind people that that needed their sight. There were the lame people that could not walk that Jesus found all around him. It it didn't matter where he went. There were people always, always. 
always in need. There were people always, always that he had, had to touch, had to help, had to give the, the, the things that were necessary for them. There were endless lost around him. Seeking the, seeking the lost was one thing, but he came to save them. He could find the lost everywhere, but he came to save them. Not to leave them in the same situation that he found them in. He came to make a difference in people's life. His purpose was to give them hope where they had no hope. To save them, not just physically. It's a good thing. It's a good thing when you're sick and you get healed. That's a good thing. But you know what? You can raise the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Lazarus is not alive today. Lazarus died again. He, he had to go back to that grave. One thing about life, you'll never get out of it alive. Just doesn't happen. He came to save them. To save them. To change their life. His time was spent changing the lives of people. Every person who came in contact with him was forever changed. They never walked away from Jesus the same after their encounter. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, these men that were supposed to know him, they were the ones that knew the word of God and should have recognized him as the Messiah. These Pharisees were never the same after they met Jesus. Every one of them were changed in every way when they met Jesus. They either loved him or they hated him. Right, right. They either found the truth of his words or they despised him with everything that they had. But they were never, ever the same because Jesus exposed them as they were. He exposed the self-righteousness in them. He showed them that the cup on the outside was clean, but it was very filthy on the inside. He told them and showed them of all of the things that they were doing wrong, and he exposed them time after time after time after time. Yet in all of their hatred and their disdain, they were never the same. John 12, 42. It says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should, should be put out of the synagogue. He changed these people that were the Pharisees. He changed these men. Nicodemus was one of the rulers that came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus came and, and, and sought the body of Jesus Christ. There were many that were in the rulers, many of those that were scribes and Pharisees and, and, and Sadducees that Jesus changed their life. They turned and, and believed in him. They wouldn't confess him openly because they were afraid of being cast out of the synagogue. But my friend, there had to come a day when they made that decision and they got themselves cast out of the synagogue. Because of their encounter with Jesus, they were never the same. Countless times in the Bible, people have had their lives radically changed by Jesus. The woman at the well had her life completely changed by Jesus. We don't know the story of this woman. We can only look at where she was at the time that she was there and, 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 and realize that there was a, 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 a shame that was brought on her life. And Jesus exposes to her the fact that she has been married many times and that the man that she is with right now is not her husband. Did Jesus condemn her? No. Jesus brought to her the truth of the word of God. He said to this woman, I that speak unto thee am he, the Messiah, I am the one that should come. I am the Messiah. The Bible says that in that short period of time that Jesus spoke to this woman, he so affected her life. There was something about his words. There was something about his countenance. There was something about him that in a very short period of time that Jesus would speak with, with her, he would change her life so much that she would go throughout the city of Samaria and tell all of the people, you've got to come and see a man that told 
told me everything about my life. Could you imagine today Jesus in the city of Soldatna speaking to somebody that, that had a hard life and telling them about the mercy and grace of his love to change their life. That person going around into Beamans and opening the door. Come on, everybody. You've got to come and see a man going into Fred Myers and screaming as loud as they can. You've got to come and see this man going to every business, going into the schools, going into the town council, into the city hall, and saying, you've got to come see this man. You see, he so radically changed her. Zacchaeus was a man that, 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 that was hated by everybody. He was a tax collector. My friend, I'm not really big on tax collectors myself. I'm sorry, Brother Aaron, I know that you were there one time, but, but you've been converted. Praise Jesus. But most people don't like tax collectors. They just don't like tax. And, and in that day, especially, in our day, tax collectors have to live by certain rules. In that day, they didn't. They could just go levy a tax. Okay, you've got a tax and you've got a tax. But, but I really don't like you, and so you're gonna t- I'm going to tax you a little bit more. And I'm going to tax you a little bit more because I don't like the way you talk to me and the way that you look at me. I can get a little bit more. And so he would, he would go and steal from people. That's what he was doing. He was going around stealing from people, and he was hated. And Jesus walked up to him one day and said, Zacchaeus, I've got to eat at your house today. I've got to go eat at your house. We're talking about a man that had no way of ever having his life changed. You're talking about a man that was so steeped in greed and so steeped in anger. And he was so steeped in all of the things that were upon him that, that his life was completely completely wound up in that power trip that he had, wound up in the hatred that he had for people and that people had for him. You talk about a man that is lost, and Jesus steps into his life and says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to go eat with you today. Went to his house, and this is what Zacchaeus had to say to Jesus. Luke 19, verses 8 and 9. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore it to him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come into this house, for as much as he is also a son of Abraham. Jesus said, or Zacchaeus said to Jesus, I will take half of my good. Could you imagine He's a very wealthy man. He's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of things. And he says, I will take half of everything. I'm going to take half of my 401k. I'm going to take half of the value of my home. I'm going to take half of the cars that I own. I'm going to take half of the snow machines, half of all of my motorhomes, half of everything that I've got, half of all of my cattle, half of all of my sheep, half of all of my gold, half of all of my wealth. I'm going to take half of everything and I'm going to go give it to the poor. You're talking about a man that was so concerned by greed that in one encounter with Jesus it changed him so he was willing to give it all up it doesn't matter to me Jesus the the wealth doesn't count to me anymore I am not after money I'm not after these things I care about people I'll give it to the poor and if I have if I have defrauded any man if I've taken more from you in taxes than I ought to take then from the half that I have left I'll give fourfold to those that I cheated throughout my life You're talking about a man in a very short time. One dinner meal with Jesus changed his life. It changed his life. Over and over again, this happens in the Bible. Multitudes of people are being changed through the encounter with Jesus. They are healed and they're returned back to normal life. They are raised from the dead. They are given words or, uh, uh, of life on a mountainside. They, they have their sins forgiven and they are told that they can go and sin no more. But we have to understand that Jesus is not a historical figure. No, no. Jesus is not like, um, like one of the kings that lived. He, he, he's not like a, 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 a ruler that, that, that you could go into your history book and find. He, he's not a, 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 a um, historical figure. That's not to say that he wasn't real. Don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. You can look in historical figures and you can find that he was real. But what I'm saying is he's not just something in history. He's just not something in the past. Jesus is not someone who lived in the past and had an impact on mankind. 
He is not someone that we simply read about as a figure who once lived, who at one time changed people's lives. This child was born on Christmas Day, and he is more than just a story. He is more than just a, 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 a historical figure. This child was and is the eternal God. He is not past. He is also present, and he is future. He is alive, and he lives forevermore. This child that was born on that day was born of, of, of man, but filled with the power of Almighty God. It was God robed in flesh. He is alive today. He does the same things today that you read about in the Bible. It's not something that you've got to look back and say, Oh, God used to heal. Oh, God used to deliver. Oh, God used to set free. And he used to be able to change lives. No, my friend, the God that I serve, the child that was born on this day is alive today. He did not only die, but he rose from the grave. The, the death, hell, and grave had no power over him. And he is alive and living lives forevermore, and he has the power to change lives today. He has the power to change lives today. Jesus is changing lives today. What he did in the New Testament, he can do in our life today. The power that he had to change lives is the same power that he has today. There is nothing that you read about in your Bible that Jesus cannot do today. There isn't a sickness that he cannot heal. There isn't a, a, a demon that he cannot deliver you from. There isn't a problem in your life that you can't overcome through the power of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Oh, you've got financial difficulties and you've got financial problems. Let me tell you something. Jesus can deliver you from it. Oh, you've got problems in your family. You've got problems with your children. You've got problems in your marriage. You've got problems, whatever it might be. You can read about Jesus healing it in the Old Testament. You can read about it in the New Testament and he does it today. Everything that you read about in the Bible, everything that he did in the New Testament church, everything that was read about in here is possible for us today too. He's alive. He's alive. He's not just a storybook. He's not just a child that was born and, and, and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. He was God Almighty robed in flesh and he has the power to change your life. This child changed my life. He changed my life. Let me tell you something. I was just a kid that just, just uh, uh, had, had been a part of a church when I was a, a little boy and, and then got uh, uh, out of church. My family stopped going to church and we lived in, in New Jersey and we didn't go to church for a period of time. We came back up here to Alaska and I lived around my cousins and I had all kinds of friends and people that were not good influences on me. I, I, I had people that were, that were very, uh, very vile in the things that they did and, and, and people that I was around all the time. I, I was over at, uh, at, at my my cousin's house. Uh, if you live in, if you're a part of my family, it seems like everybody that uh, has ever had any part of your family is your cousin. And so I was over at my cousin's house and, and, and my cousin's house happened to be good time Charlie's house because my cousin was the, the, the married to somehow around good time Charlie. And I was over there often. I've been in good time Charlie's many times, not when they were open. But I've been there. I've been around them. I, I, I know all of that stuff. I was a young man that was headed for a very troubled future. I was a young man that had influences in his life that could have destroyed him. I was a young man that was, that was headed to a very hard life. But Jesus got a hold of me. Jesus got a hold. He changed my life. He got a hold of me when I was 16 years old at a, at a Pentecostal uh, a, a youth uh, gathering. We had youth retreat that year in Seward. And I can point you to it. I've told you before, I can point you to the very spot in the church in Seward where God got a hold of my life. The power of God was so strong in that place. He shook me to my core. He got a hold of my heart and he got a hold of my life and he changed me. I wept till I couldn't weep anymore in front of that place. I cried my heart out before 
before God as I felt the power of God speaking to me and telling me, Michael, I've called you. Michael, I've got a work for you to do. Will you turn your heart to me? I got up from that place and I went home. I got into my bedroom and I took all of my rock and roll records. I took all of the things that were very precious to me. I went out into the snow and I broke every one of them. I took my eight-track tape. Yes, I had an eight-track tape. And I strung that thing out and I threw it out in the woods. I took everything that God was convicting me about and got rid of that stuff because I wanted him so much. He changed my life. He brought me into this truth. He gave me a hope when I didn't have a hope. I would be so lost today had it not been for Jesus. You would be so lost today had it not been for Jesus. You stand here today, a testimony of the love and the mercy and the power of Jesus Christ. You stand as a testimony of his love and his power to change a life. When Jesus comes into your life, you're never the same, Tom. You're not the same person that I met, that young man, when my daughter first started dating you. I saw you and I saw a young man that knew nothing about Jesus, but he got into your heart and he got into your life. And I'll never forget the service when your hands went up for the first time and tears came down your eyes and God got a hold of you and he changed you. You're not the same because this God has the power to change your life. I can never forget, Brandon, when your brother called me and he told me, my brother's talking to me about God. I never dreamed that he'd ever talk to me about God, but he's asking questions now and I need you to pray for Brandon because I believe that God's working in his life. It wasn't but a very short time thereafter that you came to this church and you, uh, we got the baptismal tank out and we filled it up right here, right in this very spot right here and we baptized you in the precious name of Jesus and we baptized your very soon to be wife in the precious name of Jesus and we baptized your little girl right there and God filled you both with the power of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't me that touched you. It wasn't me that got into your life. It was Jesus that changed you. You. I would have ne- you probably a year ago, two years ago, would have never dreamed that you would be in this church dancing around and, and worshiping God. You, you can't stay in your seat. You're ping-ponging all over the place around here. That's the power of God. That's not me that does it. It's not the beat of the drum. It's not the song. It's the love of God that he's coming to your life. He changes you. Scott. You're you're just a whole different person. I would have never dreamed that you would have turned out like you are today. But God has got a hold of you. God has taken that young man that was so hard-hearted and hard-headed, just as I was, and got a hold of you. And I'll never forget. It started a couple years ago when Brother Hernandez prayed for you in this service. And it went through August and into September and into October, November and December. You got laid off from work and you couldn't miss church anymore. But something was stirring inside and God got a hold of you and now you're on your face before him. Why? It, w- was it my preaching? Am I such a charismatic preacher? Am I so good at preaching the word that it got a hold of Scott and Chase? No, my friend, it's Jesus Christ. He has the power to change anyone's life. He's got the power to transform you and make you what he, what, what he has planned in your life. Aaron and Mary Irene, I, 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 you've told me the story of how God brought you into this truth and how God brought you into this place. But for years, for years, we all sat and did the same little routines that we did. But then God got a hold of you. And I've watched God change both of you so much. I've seen Aaron and I've seen Mary. I mean, I've seen how God has gotten into your family and has got a hold of you. And all of the things that were in your life have gone away. You've cleansed the house. You've moved the things out. And God has purified your life. And he's brought you. And you're constantly on your face before his throne. And, and God has moved in every one of our lives. Heather, God got a hold of you. I'll never forget the first time you walked into the church service. You were only going to be there one service one service that's it I'm going to come one time to prove to him that I'll be here for one service but in that one service 
But in that one time, the power of the God moved on you and you begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave you utterance and he changed you. And I'll remember, never forget both of your little girls being filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. I still got the pictures on my computer of baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ. I got my picture right standing next to them with their Holy Ghost and their baptismal certificates. My friend, it's the power of God that changes your life. It's the power of God. It's the power of God. Jesus, Jesus is alive. Jesus is not a historical figure. Jesus is not something in the past that we read about in our Bible, a cute little baby on, on this uh, Christmas day. No. no, he is the living God. He is the living God. Right. The power that is in this church. When we started, I, I, I remember the nine of us, um, where'd Mitchell go? <laughs> Mitchell and Kristen and the nine of us in our living room on that Thursday as as we, as we cast the vision of what Soldatna was going to be. Yeah. And now look, mm -hmm. has God brought this church through so much so into much. the power so that he has placed us in? This child changed my life. Yeah. This, this baby born on this day for, forever transformed me. Because it's not just a little baby. It is God Almighty, right. robed in flesh. Amen. And he has changed this church. And he, have brought, he has brought us to where we are today. Can we stand? I've gotten way off my notes. That's okay. This church has won the victories that we have won. Not by our own wisdom and might and power, but because he changes lives. He changes your life. Can we all just gather around the front here for a moment? <laughs> and so the world comes to say, that all of these beautiful little children, all, all, of, all of these kids, he want, hell wants to take them. Angela, I just can't remember the names, Josue, all of our kids, Ariel, Shalia, every one of them. Hell has designs on them. But you know, the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What God can do in these children's life is amazing. Because I believe that standing among us are preachers, pastors' wives, evangelists, missionaries, missionary wives. I believe that going forth from this church will be a multitude, a multitude of workers for his kingdom. And that God can change any life. He changed us. He gave us hope. I had no hope. Rachel, you had no hope. Elise, you had no hope. Julianne, there's no hope out there. Amanda, we have no hope. Jonathan, raised in this church, raised around this all your life. There comes a point when you have to make a decision for yourself that what I've been taught all my life is something that I'm going to use and I'm going to commit my heart to it. I don't know where you are in your life and I don't know what you've gone through. This is a battle that we go through every day. Hell attacks, hell comes against us. We, we face these things and we go through these issues. They tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. He, he faced all kinds of obstacles and situations and circumstances, but there wasn't one time, wasn't one time he was ever defeated. And you'll never find the church ever defeated, never. Why? 
because he changes our life. There's a determination, a determination in every one of us. There's a determination in our hearts, a determination in our spirits that I will never walk away from this. I will never turn from him because he changed my life. He changed my life. Jesus is still changing life. He is still moving in people. All because he has the power to change anyone. Whatever you need, wherever you are in your heart, wherever you are in your life, right now, God can change that situation. God can turn the situation that you're in from defeat to victory. God can help you in the struggles that you and I go through. God can give you the victory that you need. Could we just raise our hands, just open our hearts. If he has changed your life, can you just love him here tonight? If he's gotten a hold of you and turned you around and made you what you are today, could you just thank him for what he has done? Could we just praise him in this day? If you're in need of deliverance in your life, if you're in need of help, if you're in need of hope, tonight's your night of deliverance. Can we worship him right now?